very much for the introduction, Aaron. He, 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 didn't, he didn't mention how we met. <laughs> He's had his PhD viva. And, uh, and uh, under similar circumstances, I, I, I met the organiser of this meeting, uh, Richard, and I'd like to extend my thanks uh, to Richard for the invitation to come here. And uh, it's a pleasure to be in Ottawa for the first time and my second time uh, ever in Canada. So we, we discussed a bit what I should talk about and we, we came to the conclusion that, that this would be a suitable topic at this point in the meeting. Um, so I'm going to try and give a sort of an, an overview of, of the different approaches, I mean some of them purely conceptual, some of them practical, to photovoltaics in the future, so-called next generation photovoltaic technologies. Some of the material I'll talk about, some of the concepts have already been introduced, I, I've seen referred to earlier today, and I, and I know a little bit about what was presented yesterday, um, but, but hopefully uh, there won't be too much overlap or, 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 or repetition. So, and now we, yeah. This is the sort of like a, approximate um, out outline of the, of the talk. Uh, uh, the cartoon, I'm grateful actually to, to Michael Gretzel for, uh, for, for making me aware of this. This is many, many years ago. And uh, probably you can, you can, you can see the, the analogy between this kind of Swiss version of, uh, of, 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 uh, of a photovoltaic energy converter. And it's really trying to illustrate the problem about when you have uh, packets of energy, packets of, of, of energy of different size, that you really have an optimization problem between how much energy you catch and how much power you can generate. And, um, and that is the, the idea uh, under, underlying the principle, the principle we usually refer to as detailed balance, that, that limits the efficiency of solar cells and uh, exercises a lot of minds in trying to think of ways that we could get past it. So, I think it probably in this in this context it, it, it doesn't need uh, solar power doesn't need very much advertisement. Sometimes it's interesting to look at the size of the resource. And um, in the UK, we we, 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 we we suffer from, amongst other things, the, the attitude of the of the government in that solar power is uh, what they say is um, all very well for sunny climes, and that what we should really do in the UK is wait for technology to come down in price through its application in sunny climes, and then when it reaches that point, uh, we can be part of it too. So there's a kind of a sort of mindset that, that it doesn't make any sense in the UK. And the UK is a reasonably nice example of a context where the solar insulation is rather relatively low compared to other parts of the world, and the sort of the population density and power consumption are both relatively high. So if we look at the amount of um, uh, solar resource there is per person, we work it out to be around about uh, 500 kilowatts, but that still greatly exceeds the amount of electricity that each person um, uses, and also the amount of primary energy that, that each person uses. So the point of this slide is really to say that um, in all parts of the world, even in some of the worst cases, like, like in UK, um, there really is a huge um, abundance in the solar in solar resource and that it is quite adequate to meet human needs. It just needs to be harnessed. So um, if we look at sort of the views of kind of international agencies, and this is the, um, the international agencies, um, uh, I think, World Energy Outlook from, from 2010, they're anticipating that solar power, if we include both PV and concentrated, um, concentrated thermal solar power, will be are expected to provide something like a quarter of um, of power generation by by 2050. And um, so there's a big ambition for what so and, and of that about half of that is PV. So there's a big, if you like, international ambition for what PV ought to deliver. I, I come back at this point and, and, uh, and complain uh, about that in the UK we, we're, it's, it's considered that when we look at all of the um, renewable energy technologies that, that the government kind of acknowledges, PV is not listed and it's not considered to be viable in the UK.
But fortunately, the rest of the world doesn't suffer from the same short-sightedness. So there's a big ask um, in terms of what PV needs to deliver. And um, what I'm going to talk about... Uh, sorry, I probably should have had something introduced. What I'm going to talk about today is how it works and, and, and what the limitations are quite from really quite an abstract sort of conceptual point of view and what the different approaches are that could take us past, past the limit. So in the, in the sort of process of, of photovoltaic energy conversion, we have a, um, a, a sort of a, 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 an energy resource consisting of... Um, uh, sorry, get my... Pho photons of different energy. And we want to capture them with a solid and it needs to be a semiconductor, or it needs to have an energy gap mm -hmm. in order to have the, the capability of, of keeping um, excited electrons at a, at a higher electrochemical potential for long enough for them to be collected and made to do electrical work. And so if we were to encapsulate the whole thing, we have sort of energy which is coming from the sun in terms of photons. We have a system which is capable of absorbing some of the photons, and those photons which are absorbed are maintained above a certain um, threshold in terms of the electrochemical potential, and then they are extracted by some means, that needs to be defined, but that flux of, of these charged particles um, times their electrochemical potential gives us a, a unit of electrical work, and, 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 and that is the output from the absorption of these packets of energies from the sun. And that is kind of the very simple picture of, of how a solar cell works. Now, if we want that to work, we clearly need something which can absorb light. And we, we need this energy gap, because what the energy gap does is it slows down the thermalization of charge carriers to an extent um, where they can remain in this excited, but I suppose metastable state, for long enough for something else to happen. Um, and a semiconductor will provide those things. We also need, in order to get a, um, a sort of di directionality for, for the... In order to get a directed photocurrent, we need some asymmetry in the way that that system, that, that, that is, that system is connected to the external circuit. And uh, if we make a, a cartoon of what's going on, we have something like this. And in this case, we're, uh, we, we consider a... Um, uh, sort of an NP silicon uh, junction where you have a, a, a wafer of relatively weakly doped uh, P type silicon, and the top surface of it is modified by diffusing in these N type dopants, and that creates a, a, um, a gradient in the band structure near the top contact, and the gradient serves to attract uh, electrons towards that contact, and that gives you the built in asymmetry. And that gives you the directionality that you need to, to run a, a solar cell. So the, in, in, in the great majority of <coughs> PV systems that we see um, uh, installed, we're looking at a, waf a wafer or a film of, of, of either crystalline or multicrystalline silicon, which will be doped something like that. Um, the, the cells are connected together into modules to deliver us a useful voltage, and then modules assembled together into systems. And, and one of the very nice things about solar power is it's really um, completely scalable. And this isn't the case for something like concentrated solar power, where you need to have big facilities. With PV, the, 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 the effectiveness doesn't change very much, whether you're looking at a small device for a very low power application or um, a high power application. And uh, th th this, 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 this image here, which, which is actually real, I, I'm grateful to, to Tom Markvart for, for providing that photo many years ago, but it's just a very nice example showing the versatility of PV, because here PV is being used to provide electricity to maintain a refrigeration um, in uh, boxes which are carrying medicines in a, you know, a remote environment. And it, it wouldn't be that's easy to do that with another source of power. So 
we, 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 we know that the um, rate of uh, growth in installation of PV has been something uh, quite phenomenal. Um, great uh, majority of, of, of increased installations have been in grid connected rather than off grid PV. And um, we are looking as the, uh, as the market grows and installation grows at uh, steadily reducing uh, costs of the modules. But it's still in most parts of the world the case that the cost of the solar power is greater um, than the cost of competing sources of energy. And I was very interested in the uh, information in the last talk that, that, that in Canada the, 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 the greatest cost has got nothing to do with the module, not anything even to do with the balance of systems, but more to do with bureaucracy, which I think is interesting. Um, but it, but <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it does leave you wondering, you know, how, what, what can, what, whether what we do is, is, is really relevant or not. But anyway, <laughs> um, we, you know, we have the situation that, that the, you know, the most expensive, certainly the most expensive item, if, if I can just leave the um, bureaucracy aside for a moment, the most expensive item in delivering solar power is the cost of the silicon module. And silicon, cost of silicon module can come down and has been coming down through improvements in manufacturing technology, but not uh, in many opinions. And certainly, if I go back to our hopeless government, not in their opinion, um, coming down fast enough for it to be attractive. So what can you do to try to get past that? And then I classify this in terms of um, some, some different approaches. And one would be to try to get a better efficiency, so to get more work out of the set of photons that are being um, used in, 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 uh, in the solar, in the solar um, collector. Another approach would be to try to get away using less material than you do uh, in, in, in a standard system. And then an obvious approach is to use cheaper material. And I'm going to address those uh, ideas in that order. So in this context, it's kind of worth thinking about the, the different PV technologies. And this, this is a, a version, this is a modified version of a slide that was used by Martin Green. It was modified by my colleague, Ned Eakenstalks and then it was modified again by me. So I, I wasn't quite sure who to attribute it to. But basically, we have, you know, his, his, um, uh, his, 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 you know, his sort of, sort of uh, uh, concept is, is that there, there are things that matter, and one is the cost per unit area, and the other one is the efficiency. And uh, the, the combination of those will determine uh, the cost um, per, <laughs> per unit capacity. And you have most, uh, most uh, PV systems belong to the so-called first generation, where the, the cost of the module is high um, and the uh, if efficiency is reasonably high. And then attention to uh, cheaper materials has generated the second generation, where, where we have amorphous silicon, cadmium telluride, copper indium diselenite, and now an emerging range of other um, thin film materials where we can include um, uh, organic photovoltaics as being sort of a, a something of an extreme down here. And, um, and that is one way to try to improve the cost effectiveness by bringing down the aerial cost but not losing too much in efficiency. But then there's also um, the idea that if you could increase the efficiency by some uh, dramatic uh, factor, um, and, and do it at low cost, that you could get into a, ho a wholly different um, regime, which is referred to as third generation. And I'd just like to make this distinction that sometimes you find people talking about things like organic photovoltaics and, and dye cells as being third generation. They're not, they're second generation, according to, to definition by Martin Green. So I always have to compromise and say something like next generation when people ask me to talk about third generation solar cells and they mean organic solar cells. So, but this is, but that, that you know, if you like, those are, the, those are our, our, our generations. I'm not going to be using that, that concept anymore, but a lot of the things I'm talking about kind of belong in this sort of third generation um, uh, bubble. So I guess you, 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 you're, you're probably um, familiar with, with this resource it is a, um, a continuously updated map of 
solar cell efficiencies that has, is being compiled by uh, scientists in the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the US and it's available on, on, on the internet, you can find it on, on Wikipedia. And it's very, very useful at the moment because when I started working in solar cells, it was around about, um, it was around about here. And a lot of things w really weren't moving that fast. So when I started working on solar cells, I was working on um, uh, basically modified versions of gallium arsenide. And uh, there was an efficiency of around about 25%. It's probably, it's this, this there, was, there was this 25 sort of, this sort of jumped it towards 25%. And you see, that really didn't change until a few years ago. And uh, so we were really working in, in a context where it was like this technology does this, this technology does that. And then it was quite a kind of a sort of static in, in, in environment and, and the problems that you needed to look at stayed the same from month to month. It's not like that anymore. Um, and there's, I mean, you know, I mean, to the great you know, benefit of, of the field, it, it's now much, much, much more alive. There's much more attention being paid to the possibilities of solar power, different types of materials, different types of devices, different types of conversion <laughs> contexts. But it does mean that all of these records are being broken and broken and broken again. And so you need to have a resource like this um, <laughs> in, or in order to check where you are. This is actually not the most up-to-date version of it, but, but I, 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 you know, I like to, to, to refer to it just to, to make sure that, that you know about it. And, uh, and here, it, you know, happily it has color-coded the different generations. And um, our, our first generation silicon is, is blue. Second generation um, thin film cells are green and the sort of organic dye cells are, are orange. And then the, the, the purple refers to um, devices which are working under concentration many of which are multi-junction cells and they formally belong to the third generation. So I'm going to now address the sort of like the idea of the limiting efficiency of solar cells. So it's already been introduced to you very nicely this morning by Jeff in his lecture. But, but I, 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 I need to go back there to sort of explain, um, you know, what are the things that limit efficiency and what are the routes to get beyond that. So if we start with a very basic idea, you need a band gap, we'll accept that we need a band gap. Now, it's possible there may be some materials where actually you don't because, you know, the physics is, is, is so um, uh, peculiar that, that charge carrier relaxation happens much more slowly than it does in things that we really know about. But, but let's suppose for the moment that we need that. And we need directionality, and we'll assume that we've got both of those. And then we make the following assumptions. So we'll say that for every photon which has got energy larger than the band gap, that it generates an electron hole pair. We will then say that the charge carriers, the, the populations of charge carriers that are, that are generated by the absorption of light, that they form a distribution which is in thermal equilibrium, or strictly quasi-thermal equilibrium with the surroundings. And what does that mean? Well, it means that the, sort of the, the distribution in energy follows a Fermi distribution, but that rather than the electrons and the holes sharing the same Fermi level, which they would if they were in equilibrium, they each have their own Fermi level. So, um, and the Fermi, and that separation between the Fermi levels it is given by a particular quantity here referred to it as delta mu. So that, that quantity it is the chemical potential that's generated by the light. And we need that um, to, 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 to deliver work in a thermodynamic sense. So we then say that all of the charges can be extracted, or you know, just refer to electrons, they can be extracted with the same uh, electrochemical potential, uh, delta mu, and that that is equal to, a, to E times the voltage, potential difference, which is detected at the terminal itself. And then finally, we say that 
the only way in which charge carriers can be lost is through um, radiated recombination, otherwise known as spontaneous emission. So that's like saying that your material is perfect, it has no defects. Um, but we can't switch off uh, radiated recombination because if you switch off radiated recombination, you have to switch off absorption. And if you switch off absorption, you can't have solar cells. So that kind of comes from the original detailed balance, which was Einstein's. Um, and, 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 and he showed that there was a, a, a direct relationship between the, the rate at which um, photons would be absorbed through a combination of absorption and uh, stimulation, <laughs> the rate at which photons were emitted um, through spontaneous emission. And, and basically, if you want to turn that off, you need to turn down the, uh, you, 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 you have to forbid um, absorption of light. Is it not working? Yeah, I realized after I started talking, I didn't know when I started talking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I should have said is, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So, 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 so we make these stipulations, and, that, and that's really simplifying the system as much as we, as we possibly can. And then you look at this and you see, okay, so under those circumstances, what will the limiting efficiency be? And um, Jeff has already um, shown you, you that, and the limiting efficiency is in the low 30s percent if you have unconcentrated sun, and, um, and, it, and the actual value depends upon which spectrum you use. Um, now, the bits that go into it kind of mathematically, so I have this, it's a, sorry, it's a rather crude drawing, but we consider that just to try and give a sort of like a, a sort of a, a sort of try and give a sort of picture of where the different bits fit together. So once we've made those assumptions, we say that we have a um, sort of like that the, the solar cell, if you like, can see uh, in uh, sort of a, a hemisphere and it receives radiation through just part of that that will be defined by the solid angle subtended by the sun or the solid angle subtended by the concentrating system if you have a concentrator there and um, for, for to make the calculation simple um, it's convenient to consider that the sun is not air mass 1.5 g or d or anything else but it's a black body which is emitting with the spectrum of a black body at a particular temperature, which is around about 5,800 Kelvin. It, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable approximation. It's not great, but it, but it makes the calculations much easier. Um, and, and so from, from the point of view of the solar cell, there's just a fraction of the sky, and that's sort of x times beta. So x would be 1 for unconcentrated light, and beta is, is if you like, that is the, the factor by which the radiant intensity of the sun has been diluted by the fact that the sun is so very far away. If you were on the surface of the sun, then beta would be 40,000 times bigger. <laughs> and then the solar cell is also receiving radiation from the rest of the sky, which we can consider as being a black body with the temperature of the ambient, so the same temperature that the cell is in. We, we make in, in the detailed balance the assumption that the cell is at the temperature of its surroundings. Um, and because it's at that temperature, then it can also emit um, light, just like the, the, the sky can, but it emits light at a rather uh, higher rate at a higher intensity than, than it would if it were in equilibrium because it has been electrochemically excited. And uh, I can't, if you like, prove the origin of that, 
But I mean, if you simply think about an LED, when you apply a potential bias to it, you can get it to emit light, and it emits much more light than it would at equilibrium. Um, it's basically the same principle, and there is a formalism that we can use to describe the solar cell like that. And then the charge carriers which have not been lost through this radiation from the cell, they are then available. And in the detailed balance limit, we, we assume that there's no other loss process than this. So they all get collected. And we also assume that there's no um, resistive losses. So they all get collected with exactly the same electrochemical potential that the charge carriers have at the point of generation. So we have all of those. That, that's kind of, if you like, the, the, the sort of the... Um, the, the meaning of the different or the effect of the different assumptions, and then we can put it into some kind of formalism. So, um, uh, for as if we try to look at it as a kind of thermodynamic system, you, we we have the sun <coughs> with its um, with its temperature and it's at equilibrium itself, so it radiates like a black body. You have the rest of the sky; it radiates like a black body. We have our solar cell; it's at the um, it's at the ambient temperature. I can't remember why I called that TS, but, but it means the ambient. Um, and it is emitting light, but, but more than a black body would, because it's not at equilibrium. And then we want to extract that um, sort of work that it's generating, which is the particle flux. So that's the number of, if you like, the current, the flux of excited electrons times their electrochemical potential. That's a, a quantity um, with the units of work. And as a, if we do it in the steady state as a function of time, it's a quantity with the units of power. So we can then make a bookkeeping equation which is telling us what, how much current uh, is coming. Um, I can use the cursor for this. Can I? Uh, it's a bit worried about... OK. Um, so, we, so we put together the different bits. So this is going to be... So in terms of that, in terms of that flux, right, N is going to be current density divided by electric charge. We have the, um, the flux which comes from this, this, this track, from the absorption of, of solar radiation. We have a very much smaller flux which comes from the absorption of ambient radiation. And they're both positive. They contribute to the current. So we've made the, the convention. We, we're just taking here the convention that photocurrent is positive. And then um, we subtract from that the the emitted flux from this part, which is going to be given by um, uh, we, wh wh where the, the, the here we have the black body spectrum of photons coming from the sun, black body spectrum of photons coming from the ambient, and here um, the spectral shape to a good approximation is the same shape as it would be in equilibrium, but its magnitude is amplified by a factor which is e to the chemical potential over kT. So, so these bits we add together, and that will, what's left over will be the current that we get out. And, um, and we can then collect terms and arrange it into something which looks very like, in fact, is the ideal diode equation. So what goes in there? Well, the bits that don't depend, remember that, um, that delta mu is E times the voltage, so that this bit is voltage dependent. So if we... If we t consider the parts that aren't voltage dependent, they're only dependent on the spectrum, mainly from the sun, a little bit from the ambient, and they would add together and give you the short circuit current density. And then we can subtract from that the part which is voltage dependent, and that gives you something which is uh, independent of the solar spectrum, um, but dependent on, on, on the voltage between the terminals of the cell. Um, and, and you can see this is the ideal diode equation. You've already seen it this morning, um, where here with an ideality factor of one, that's what you get from the thermodynamic processes. And the, current, the net current that you get out is a function of bias. It's a function of spectrum through JSC. And so you have, in the ideal case, constant current and then a voltage-dependent dark current. And that gives you your JV curve. You look for the point where J times V is a maximum and you find your power conversion efficiency, etc. So what's the parameter that matters here? What, what, what variables have you got? Well, not many after we've made so many simplifications. We can't really um, do much about the sun. We can't 
do well. We could, for example, repeat this in different uh, ambient temperatures, but they're not really within our control to vary. What is within our control to vary is this quantity, the band gap. So that will tell us how much of the solar spectrum is being captured. And the other thing that's in principle within our control to vary is a concentration factor. So you could have a concentrating system that would increase the amount of light which is coming from the sun. So um, if we just consider what happens um, to the short circuit current density and the open circuit voltage in the detailed balance limit, as the band gap goes up, the short circuit current comes down and the voltage extracted increases. Um, there's actually an error for those of you who are paying attention. This, 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 th that's actually the wrong line. It should be somewhat less than that, and I just noticed it um, uh, too late to do anything about it. But, but basically the principle is current comes down, voltage goes up as you vary the band gap. If we look at our um, JV characteristics, that can be, that, that's sort of illustrated here. So if you have a high band gap, um, uh, lots of voltage, not very much current. Low band gap, lots of current, not very much voltage. Uh, the best situation is going to be somewhere in between. And then you can calculate efficiency as a function of band gap under a given concentration. So this is a calculation which is done for a black body sun. That's why it looks so smooth compared to the efficiency versus band gap that you saw for the air mass 1.5 spectrum earlier today. And the maximum is around about um, the, the is around about 33 percent. So, um, to then give an idea of what's happening to the power from the sun that's not being extracted as work, we can look at it graphically uh, with something like this. So, one of the important things here about 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 efficiency of solar cells, and it really comes down to the idea that you have this band gap, and every photon with energy larger than the band gap, although they've all got different energy, each is only as good as each other in terms of the, um, in terms of the, the power that it'll generate. Any photon with energy greater than the band gap is delivering the same amount of power to the external circuit, and that's because um, in, a, you know, in a continuous solid, um, it's, it's, it's very, the, the process of relaxation of a, of a charge carrier of an electron from the excited state to the, to, to the, um, to the conduction band edge is very rapid. Um, so it thermalizes, it gives out heat, it heats up the material a little bit, um, and that energy is not available to us to extract as work normally. And that, is, that loss is kind of represented here uh, in the difference between... So, so what we've plotted here... This is the power coming from the sun, this black thing. And if you integrate under that, that's, 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 the de that's the denominator when you calculate your power conversion efficiency. And then what's under the red, that is the power that you actually get as at different wavelengths for that spectrum. Um, and, uh, and if you integrate under that, that, that will be your, the, the numerator of the power conversion efficiency. So what you've lost, the basically two big regions, one for photons of energy higher than the band gap, and then one for photons of energy lower than the band gap. Below the band gap, you don't absorb any of the photons, so that's all lost. Above the band gap, you absorb the photons, but you lose uh, more and more of the photon energy through this process of thermalization. And so, you know, the, 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 these are kind of, you know, attractive if you look for other parts of the um, sort of solar resource to, to try to mine. Uh, in terms of how well different uh, 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 sort of solar cell technologies are, are doing, so, so this, this curve was done with a, with, a, with a proper spectrum, that's why it's bumpy. But um, silicon is standing at around about 25%, gallium arsenide around about 27, 28%. And then um, the thin film materials, so cadmium telluride is around 20 um, uh, sorry, it's, it's around about 17. Uh, SIGS is around about 20, almost the same as polycrystalline silicon. And uh, amorphous silicon has never really um, got past. Uh, it, was, it was a great, great, great hope in the sort of late 1970s, early, early 80s, that amorphous silicon was, w w was going to become a viable alternative to crystalline silicon. But, but um, efficiency kind of got stuck at around about 12%, and it hasn't really raised since then. 
And then we have um, where I've been working for the last 10 years in, in molecular materials and uh, in the case of polymer-based solar cells. So you've heard about those yesterday from um, Mario Leclerc and, and I'm sure many of you are, are working on, on those sorts of materials. Their efficiencies are, are, are gradually creeping up and now stand at around about 9 or 10 percent. So this is um, just, just to give sort of an, an example of a, a very high efficiency solar cell. And I'm actually, I'm actually hesitating about whether this really is still the highest efficiency single junction um, gallium arsenide solar cells. It might have moved since the last time I talked about this. But the, the point I wanted to make with this slide is that um, the... Uh, the, you know, so I mentioned that um, the, the efficiency of um, uh, gallium arsenide single junctions in one sun were kind of stuck at 25% for about 20, 20, tw about 20 years, and then they increased. And, and the thing that was done to, 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 to lead to the increase was, was something really quite fundamental, and it concerns um, detailed balance. So when you do the... Um, the, the calculation of, of detailed balance, we have to do a, a bookkeeping between uh, radi uh, radiation that comes from the sun and radiation that comes out from the cell. And part of the, the radiation that's lost from the cell is lost through the substrate. And part is lost to the outer atmosphere. And uh, if you could switch off what's lost to the substrate by putting in something which reflects light there, it actually improves the ratio of um, absorbed against emitted radiation. And that was done um, by, 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 I think, Brendan Case and, and, and colleagues in, 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 in this work, where they built a thin film gallium arsenide solar cell on a reflective substrate. So you get internal trapping of radiation and then less, of the, less uh, power is radiated out through the back. Um, this works because in gallium arsenide, in very, very pure gallium arsenide, you're getting close to the place where radiative efficiency really matters. Ra ra radiative losses really matter. Um, you try to do that with a much more defective material and, and it wouldn't have the same positive effect at all. So, um, as it's already been, been pointed out today, the, the efficiency can also, it don't, apart from depending on band gap, it also depends on um, concentration. And if you were to concentrate the light to its maximum effect, then that would, that would then kind of mean that all of the radiation received by the sun, by, by the cell, was, was, was coming from the sun. There was no fraction coming from the sky. And that has the effect of reducing the... Uh, amount of uh, losses that can be made. It, it, it changes the ratio between the, um, the radiation emitted and the radiation absorbed. I mean, like what you do with the back reflector, only to a much larger extent. And, um, and that gives you a, a different efficiency curve, which has a higher maximum at around about 44 degrees, 44 percent. Um, and, and it also, the, 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 the efficiency peak also shifts to a slightly different energy gap. So what I want to do now is to sort of look at how we can try to sort of, if we think about that, that, that um, plot of the radiance from the sun and the, and the power that you can actually extract from the cell, I want to look at different ways in which we can try to sort of mine the regions that, that aren't being properly that aren't being exploited in a standard detailed balance um, single junction solar cell. And uh, if we think of it in, 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 in words, you know, what, what were our problems? So the problems were that because we had a single band gap, um, it, it kind of, it had the effect of meaning that photons with energy much larger than the band gap couldn't be properly exploited. And they a route to that, and you know all about this from, from, from yesterday and, and from earlier today, one route to, to address that problem is to include more than one band gap in your solar cell. Then another approach would be not to consider the band gaps, but to consider whether there are ways of getting more out of those um, hot 
electrons before they relax down to the band gap. And, and those ideas are usually considered kind of as being ideas for so-called hot carrier solar cells. And then another way to do it is to think about sort of manipulating the solar spectrum so that you can actually absorb some of the light that's being um, normally passing through the cell in a material which is able to re-emit it and then absorb it again. Uh, so, so you would absorb it in a material which is not the solar cell. It re-emits at a wavelength that the solar cell can absorb, and so you get to use it as well. And that's done um, by, by some, some different approaches. So the idea of multiple band gaps, we can look at it sort of conceptually like, like this. If our single band gap was the, was the red curve, then if you, if you look at sort of how much of that irradiation you're able to harvest with two or three band gaps, then you're able to increase that, that, that fraction of power. This is a sort of an example when you have two band gaps, an example when you have three band gaps. And you can see that if you went up to something like an infinite number of band gaps, you'd be able to, you know, uh, extract a reasonable fraction of the radiant power. Not all of it, just a higher fraction of it. Uh, and, and, and how is that done? Well, we can think of it that in, in the sort of standard case, uh, we lose uh, infrared photons because they're not absorbed, and we lose part of the energy from blue photons because although they're absorbed, they lose their, um, they lose the electrons, lose some of their, um, their, their additional energy. And if you can then split your spectrum, you could choose a more ideal band gap for photons of different energy. And if they could be connected together without losses, then you could get more energy out. It's well known, you've heard about it yesterday, but I need to include it as really in terms of kind of third generation approaches, it's the one that actually works. Um, I, I, I don't say it's the only one that can work, but you know, this, you know, it, this does work. <laughs> and there are others that could work, but they don't work that well just yet. Um, and so then this is, you know, it, with, so with multi-junctions, it gets you into, you know, a nice, uh, in the sense that they're addressable problems in material science. Um, so Jeff has, has already explained um, that, that uh, you know, the sort of like a, a very practical structure is one where you have uh, devices of different band gap, one on top of the other, and you absorb high energy photons first, strip them off, that leaves you with a spectrum containing, you know, medium to low energy photons and so on and so forth. And then you try to sort of use a different band gap to, to sort of select and convert different parts of the solar spectrum. Um, and in order to do this um, in a single device, it would be nice if you could just grow one semiconductor layer on top of another semiconductor layer separated by your uh, tunnel junctions. And that then gives you the problem of finding different semiconductor materials that actually want to be on top of one another. But the 3-5 um, family of, of compound semiconductors, it gives you a lot of options. And uh, for example, in the case of um, uh, the, the sort of indium gallium phosphide, gallium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide nitride case, uh, this is a triple junction cell where the band gap the, sorry, the, 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 the lattice constant of the different crystals involved would be similar to that of gallium arsenide. So basically what you do is you consider what are the you know, uh, compound semiconductors available. So this, this line here for the nitrides going from gallium nitride to indium nitride, um, it's spanning through a number of different band gaps, but you can also see the lattice constant changes as you change the composition. So as you put some gallium into your indium nitride, you raise the band gap, and you also change the lattice constant. And if you wanted a lattice constant of something or other, there will be a composition at which you get it. Um, and when you go to quaternaries, then you can have almost anything. It's just in many cases, the materials, they either become some diff different things happen. Sometimes you can't really make them. And sometimes um, they, they start being indirect band gap semiconductors, which means they don't absorb light very well, which means they're not quite as useful as they could be. But, but um, but so, but anyway, sort of, but the combination of different 3-5 um, um, semiconductors was successfully exploited to, to generate high efficiency triple junctions, and the same approach is being used for even larger numbers of junc junctions. 
and, and uh, a lot of nice work being done on that in, in the Fraunhofer Institute. Um, so then I, I want to, to just mention a bit, this is, I mean, it's, it's maybe n not uh, kind of, if you like, but practically that relevant nowadays, but this is actually where I, I entered photovoltaics. I came as, as a postdoc to Imperial College to work on this problem. And um, he, th this problem was a good teacher. So the idea was that you have, so if we consider the, the situation of the detailed balance, you've got this compromise which is based on the band gap. The band gap controls the current, the band gap controls the voltage. If all you can change is a band gap, then it's going to change voltage and current in concert, and it's going to give you something um, which you can't vary very much. So my uh, uh, former supervisor, Keith Barnum's idea, was to see, can you put together different materials of different band gap into the active region of a solar cell and achieve a situation where you can get current um, dominated by the lower of the two band gaps but um, <coughs> voltage not dominated by that, but rather dominated by the band gap of cladding material. So you would have a kind of multi-layer structure with an absorbing region, which was able to extend to lower photon energies, and then that would be embedded within a, a sort of like PNN region from another material, and we would rely on the doping levels in the PNN region to determine the, um, and its band gap, to determine the, the, the voltage of the whole device. And, um, and that was uh, a, very, a very nice um, sort of um, challenge that, 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 that we worked on. And I think it's still, if you ask me the question today, is there any advantage? So, so wh wh okay, so wh one question to ask might be, um, why, why is this any better than, let's say, a heterojunction where you have wide back gap, um, narrow gap, wide gap? And the idea was that uh, because these layers are very, very thin, so-called quantum wells, apart from having the advantage of being able to tune the absorption edge exactly, um, you have uh, um, a you, you have a, a, a sort of like a disincentive for the charge carriers to thermalize down to the band <coughs> edge because of the lower density of states in there, and because in many cases, it's not drawn in this diagram, the possibility that the charge carrier could escape from there by partly by tunneling through the barriers because all the layers are rather thin. So, you know, there were kind of good physical reasons to consider that this would work differently from a simple semiconductor heterojunction. And, uh, you know, that work um, pro progressed. Uh, uh, I, 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 I moved to, to different materials after uh, a number of years, but this work uh, carried on in Imperia and, it, and in uh, about three years ago, the group was very happy that they had got the highest efficiency um, single junction gallium arsenide based solar cell. And uh, the way that they, 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 they so, so, the, so, 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 so the idea here is that if we consider um, the, the absorption edge is going to be determined by the the material with the lowest band gap, and here it's the indium gallium arsenide. And uh, they solved, th there were a lot of problems in the material signs of these structures, but they basically were solved by using so-called strained layer structures, where the lattice constant of the alternating layers is slightly different. And that had the effect of, of, of actually making the whole structure, if you got it right, it makes the whole structure very clean in terms of defects. Um, because the layers are very thin, that they're, because they're thin, they can accommodate the strain at the, at the interfaces that would normally give rise to defects. So they made very, very nice quality multi-layer materials, and they got a, 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 a high efficiency for a concentrated gallium arsenide solar cell. But one of the things that they used, because they understood this problem, was they used a, a back reflector, which has the function of of pushing, of reflecting the, um, the radiation emitted by the active layer back into the solar cell. And that, as we've seen in the single junction gallium arsenide cell I showed before, that has the effect of raising the efficiency. So um, fairly soon after that record was, was reached, uh, um, another group uh, uh, which could do it p uh, published an even better, just slightly better performance just with gallium arsenide. 
So uh, Keith was rather upset. But anyway, it was, it was, uh, <laughs> it, it was, it was a nice moment. Um, so, so this is, you know, it's, 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 it's another idea. And I think we still, you know, it's very, very hard to say um, in theory whether the quantum well solar cell will perform better than the, 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 the single junction device if you can optimize absolutely everything. I mean, I think there are ways in which you can, particularly if you take, account of the, if you take into account the optical anisotropy of the materials, but the, the size of the effect is, is going to be a relatively, relatively limited one, and then there's a big question about whether it's worthwhile investing everything you have to to make such a complicated structure not to gain very much. So the second route in sort of getting beyond detailed balance limit was the idea of um, extracting um, more work per photon by, by somehow interrupting or, or slowing down the relaxation of the charge carriers. And so if, if, we, if we think about you know, what, what happens when you, when you absorb light inside a solar cell, to begin with, uh, your, your, your system is in thermal equilibrium. So this red thing in the middle is a Fermi level. And you absorb some photons, and that will excite some charge carriers you know, from some states to some other states. And then you'll have some distribution of charge carrier energy. So that's like, if you like, at time T0 after the, after the photons are absorbed. And then those char the electrons in the holes will scatter from each other and they form a sort of a, a distribution. Um, uh, that, that happens very, very quickly. This happens in femtoseconds. So they form a distribution, but the distributions are still hot. Um, they just have some equilibrium because they're interacting with each other. And then over a period of time, and this is kind of between uh, femtoseconds and picoseconds, this charge carrier population cools, and it cools because the charges are interacting with the nuclei, with atoms in the lattice, and giving up some of their kinetic energy. And so they will eventually come into, so here they're hot. They have a distribution which is characteristic of a higher temperature, and then they, cool, they, they, they scatter with the lattice, and they become into thermal equilibrium with the lattice, and they cool down so that their temperature distribution is described by the ambient temperature. And in that process, um, the, 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 sort of the, the Fermi levels that the charge carrier populations refer to separate. And um, eventually, under longer periods of time, like nanoseconds or microseconds, depending upon the material, um, the, 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 these, these excited populations reduce in size through recombination processes, uh, either radiative recombination or re uh, recombination through defects or other types of things. So, um, it sort of de de detailed balance is, is basically dealing with this situation where um, only radiative recombination is allowed. Now, the, the sort of goal in, in sort of trying to achieve hot carrier solar cells would be to try to get in here um, before your charge carrier populations have completely cooled and to see if you could extract your electrons or your holes with higher um, sort of like on average kinetic energy than they have when they have thermalized with the lattice. And uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a very attractive idea in terms of sort of the part of the, the um, you know, the sort of like energy pot that we're looking at, we're looking at trying to get some of that energy that's being lost by thermalization. And, you know, the, there is, I think, you know, I probably, uh, I was going to say something about quantum wells, but uh, uh, let, let me come to the next slide first. Um, sort of, the, 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 the idea of, of hot carrier solar cells, so I think if you go back to maybe early 1990s, possibly 1980s, there was a nice paper by Ross and Nozick, Art Nozick, who's in NREL in the US, where they, they recognized that um, idea and they were looking at what the potential would be if you could really capture that energy. And the problem really um, is it in real materials, it's very hard to slow down the process of thermalization with the lattice. And uh, materials in, in, in which 
which offer the possibility of slowing down that thermalization uh, include um, quantum dot particles where the density of electronic states is kind of um, is, is, is lower. So wh when you have a three-dimensional semiconductor, you have a continuous density of states. There are no gaps in it from the conduction band up to whatever the top of that band. When you have a, 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 a particle, a piece of semiconductor which is quantum <coughs> confined in three dimensions, then you have an energy spectrum which is at a discrete set of levels. And, um, and, and that applies both to the, um, the electronic spectrum but also to the, the, the phonon spectrum. And so it's, it's, it's sort of possible in principle to slow down um, relaxation because the, the transition between one uh, electronic energy level and the next one might not be bridgeable by an available photon. Um, and quite a few scientists have sort of tried to observe that and uh, slowing down has been observed and this is just one, one study from a, a couple of years ago where they were able to sort of measure the uh, decay time for uh, charges that were photo excited in a, in a system of quantum dots um, of two, two six quantum dots and they were able to show that depending for very depending on the, the, the quantum dot size that you could um, slow down um, the rate of, of relaxation. But it's not, you know, that, that's just part of the problem. And uh, to actually try and make something like this work in, in practice, you have to make sure not only that you can slow down the relaxation of the charges, but you have to make sure that you can extract them more quickly than they would slow down. And if you're dealing with quantum dots, then that's not, you know, there are some issues in trying to, to extract charges uh, from, from confined particles. And then very importantly, the thing is when you come to the electrodes, uh, you need to maintain that sort of non-equilibrium distribution of energies, and that's not that easy to do. So there, there are people who have ideas about it, but, but at the moment I think it would be fair to say that it's really a kind of like a, a sort of, a, 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 sort of a, a, a more conceptual goal rather than a practical one. Um, then the other route that I, that I mentioned was the idea of sort of kind of manipulating the solar spectrum so that you can make use of some of those photons that were passed through the semiconductor material. So in, in, in terms of my, my, my diagram, we're now looking at this bit and seeing can we get some of the energy from the photons which have passed through because their photon energy was lower than the band gap? And um, I think the answer is yes, but not an awful lot. And the way that that, I don't know if there's anything else. Yeah. So one of the ways that that, that, that that can be done would be you have your semiconductor material, so light is absorbed, and then the infrared light will pass through. And if you put something underneath the cell which is able to absorb the infrared photons and then emit light, but it might absorb in the red and then emit over a broader band, including um, higher energies, then some of that re-emitted light would be absorbed in the semiconductor and that would contribute to the photocurrent. And so materials that, that have been studied, used for that, they're tip, they're, they're a, lot of, a reasonable amount of work has been done using rare earth oxides. Um, uh, w w which have the property that they can absorb sort of infrared light and then emit light over a, a broader range, including higher energy photons. And small improvements in quantum efficiency were observed with that. But I wanted to give a, a rather different example because I think it's um, uh, interesting. And uh, this is to use as the sort of absorbing and emissive material, the, the material which basically changes the shape of the spectrum, it's to use molecular material for that. And uh, it's the idea of the so-called mole molecular upconversion. And what's happening here is that you have a combination of two molecules, and one of them is um, good at absorbing infrared or red light, um, and the other one isn't. And the one that is absorbing infrared light, it also has the, the, the property that the... So when a, when a photon is absorbed in a molecular material, it generates a, an excited state called the singlet. Singlet refers to the symmetry that it has to have 
in order to be an optically a dipole allowed transition. But there is also an excited state which is um, generally lower in energy called the triplet. It has a different symmetry. And uh, depending upon which molecule you have, the transition, a, a singlet state can decay to a triplet. And in some cases, it can do that quite efficiently. So this is an example of a, a molecule which has a property that the singlet and triplet are quite closely coupled. So photons are absorbed in the molecule. They generate singlets. The singlets then generate triplets. And those, if you have two, the, 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 the triplet is then able to transfer its energy to one of the other, other molecules, which in this case is a rubrine. And rubrine has got the, the special property that its triplet energy is much lower than its singlet energy. And so if rubrine is able to accept two triplets from two um, excited versions of the other molecule, they um, can, and with a certain efficiency they do, annihilate each other and generate instead a singlet. And so you take two low energy photons, they're absorbed in molecules like that, um, then uh, in, it certainly works quite well in solution, not quite so well in the film, but those, when those triplets can come together uh, close to a rubrine, transfer their energy to the rubrine, rubrine is excited and it is then able to emit a photon which is of a higher energy than either of the photons that was absorbed in the first place. So it's two for one, it's not, it's not unit, you know, you, you, you have to absorb more infrared photons to get fewer green photons out, or I should say red photons to get fewer red photons out, uh, green photons out, but still, it works. And um, this is a, a, a paper that was uh, published this year by a group in uh, University of Sydney, and um, just really, it sort of this is just illustrating the, the concept. They, they did it on an amorphous silicon solar cell, reasonably thin, and um, sort of red light is passed through, um, but it's absorbed by this material underneath, and then re some of it is re-emitted and absorbed in the semiconductor material. And you got efficiencies of um, uh, photocurrent generation efficiencies of up to about 2% at the most optimistic wavelength. So that spectrum is quite like the spectrum, the absorption spectrum of the material that's used. Um, this, so th this is something where, and, and I think, um, you know, wh when you think about these, these concepts of, you know, controlling sort of like the, 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 the energy of the states that absorbed photons generate, I think molecular materials have got quite a lot of potential here because, you know, through chemical design, you've got, if you like, the, the capability to come up with something which has got the spectrum which could be suitable for a particular purpose. <coughs> And so I was actually very pleased to see this result. This is a better performance than anybody has got using a, a phosphor uh, up converter. Okay, it's still a very small effect, but you know it's um, it, it's really not it's really not not bad given that it's um, uh, you know quite a, an ambitious concept. So I, I'm, I'm less excited about this. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm less excited about the next one, but. And this is this is this is this is this is this is this is, this is Meg, isn't it? Um, so the the other end of that uh, uh, sort of you know the the other side of the reshaping the spectrum idea would be: can you take high energy photons and split them into lower energy photons, and then absorb you know have two, and then get two hits for the for the price of one? So if you have a very high energy photon, can you somehow? Um, uh, convert its energy into two photons and get two electrons out rather than one. This is the principle of multiple exciton generation. You probably all know all about it, so I don't need to say very much. But basically, that, that, that's the idea from a very simplistic sort of energy level point of view. The efficiency to which it actually happens will depend on the electronic structure or the band structure of the materials involved because uh, other things need to be conserved as well as energy. And um, sort of nice work done by uh, Randy Ellingson and, 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 and co-workers in NREL uh, a number of years ago showed that you could um, increase uh, the um, sort of charge generation and then the photocurrent generation efficiency um, by using high energy photons in particular materials. In his case, he was using 
I think, lead, lead um, sulfide uh, quantum dots. So when you got far into the UV, um, you then could observe an enhanced quantum efficiency more than one. So some of the UV photons were successfully being split into smaller energy photons and generating more than one charge pair. Um, one of the sort of difficulties with this is there's actually not an awful lot of solar light that you can harvest in the UV. Um, and, you know, okay, you could kind of re-optimize re the problem, but, but, the, but the process seems to become efficient at, at three times the, the, the band gap. And, uh, you know, if you try to, to take that to the limit and say, okay, I'll work with a very low band gap solar cell, work with something like half an EV or three quarters of an EV band gap, then you really get into problems in terms of the material heating up. Um, so, I mean, I have some, you know, I, 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 th I think it's an interesting topic, um, but, but I don't either see it as being a, a really practical route to getting high efficiencies. So, if we just come to a, a kind of a, a, a verdict on these topics, um, in terms of, you know, the, 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 the approach of multiple band gaps using, for example, tandem structures, that works. Um, and, you know, critics will say multi-junction cells are expensive, they, they cost a lot of energy to grow, but on the other hand, you would normally be using them in concentrator systems if you use them terrestrially, and uh, that changes the, you know, the, the cost effectiveness. A concentrator system likes to have a high efficiency solar cell, and if you can make the optics cheap enough, um, then it, it need not necessarily mean that the, 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 the semiconductor device at the center is, is outrageously expensive. Then we have the, the, the idea of uh, more work per photon through, through the sort of hot carrier idea, and say there is some evidence that you can get, um, you can slow down cooling, but I think this is probably the most far-fetched of all these goals. This is the, the realistic one, this is the most far-fetched one, and this one is sort of reshaping the spectrum. I think it's a reasonable approach, and there's quite a lot of, uh, you know, different ideas and different approaches to work with that. So, um, moving on. So that was really all to do with the idea of getting more work per photon. And um, another approach is to try to um, get more uh, performance or more current out of the photons that you actually have. Um, sorry, that's probably a bit of a, a stupid way to, to say it. I try to summarize some of the, the different approaches here, but concentration we'll talk about. But a, a typical, so I mean, I mean, if we don't, if, if, sorry, this is, this is a completely rubbish picture, but I, I, for reasons I won't go into, I didn't have time to make a nice one. <laughs> I, I did delete it and then I stuck it back in because I thought well, it was kind of reasonably useful just to show the, the, the range of things. But in a, in a, in a typical system, you, 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 you would have, you know, if you just have your semiconductor material, you lose photon energy through reflection and through transmission in principle. Um, you can reduce on reflection by using techniques like anti-reflection coatings, which are used in all solar cells. Um, you can, you, you basically want to, to, to you, can, you can couple more uh, light in by using, um, also, also, as well as anti-reflection coatings, also by using concentration that increases the angular range of the sun. But then you can do things to the, the structure of the device which will help to reduce transmission by trapping light inside the cell and in some cases by managing the light field so that you enhance the probability of absorption. Um, concentration, I, I don't need to, to say very much about, but, but basically you can have big systems and small systems. You can concentrate the light using reflection or using refraction. Um, and, and when you have a concentrated light field, the potential efficiency increases. But that's not the reason it's done. The reason it's done is because it allows you to capture a larger area of sunlight using a smaller area of expensive semiconductor material. Um, and things like the high efficiency multi-junction cells are normally be con being considered in um, concert with a concentrator system. So in terms of the second uh, point here, that was light trapping. Um, the, 
Light trapping has always been used in, um, in silicon. And, and can be, and, and, and here in the, in the case of silicon, it, it's because your, your devices are typically quite thick compared to the wavelength of light, it's easy to build in structures on the surface of the device which, are, which have the effect of coupling more light in simply by you know, reducing, to, from a ray tracing approach, reducing the amount of light that would be lost um, through reflection from the surface. Um, when you get down to thinner materials, and in the case of um, thin film materials, you're talking about thicknesses, device thicknesses of typically 10 uh, microns. And with thin film silicon, you know the holy grail would be to get towards uh, devices that are some tens of microns thick. Then, then it, it becomes less practical to have structures like that on the surface because they become large compared to the thickness of the solar cell. Um, and one thing that is sort of quite popular in, in the field at the moment is to try to exploit um, plasmonic effects in solar cells. And, and so by plasmonic effects, I, I refer to a situation where you have a sort of metallic structure, usually a nanostructure, uh, uh, adjacent to a semiconductor. And uh, the, the presence of a metallic structure, so when it interacts with light, um, high frequency oscillations are set up within the metallic structure and they modulate the electric field around. So effectively, they, they, they can increase the, the density of photon states in the region of the nanostructure and that can lead to enhanced absorption. Now, um, my, 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 my colleague Ned and I think, um, I'm probably, probably going to be challenged on this, that um, the, the most effective way, in tw and so there's been quite a lot of work in using putting arrays of nanoparticles, you know, on top of d devices, under devices, at junctions in the middle of devices with the intention of enhancing the, the optical absorption. Um, but, but possibly the, 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 the kind of, it, 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 for, for the systems which work quite well, it's, it's quite difficult to say whether it's really a plasmonic effect or whether it's effectively a light scattering effect. And, um, some, uh, because wh when you have this sort of nanoparticle ar array on the um, surface of the solar cell, it's going to have the, it modulates the light field and that will have the effect of scattering the light. Now, if you have a light trapping structure here which sort of broadens the angular range of the light coming in, the general effect is going to be to increase the path length of the light within the device and so increase the chances of absorption. But anyway, um, some nice uh, uh, work has been done in this by, this is from Kylie Minogue in, um, uh, in Canberra. And uh, she has shown that um, if you can put your sort of nanoparticle array, so silver and gold are good materials to, for, for this kind of you know, plasmonic resonance effect because they've got resonances that are in the visible part of the spectrum. And she finds that if you put the particles at the back of the cell rather than at the top, that's more effective than putting them at the top. And uh, in the case of a sort of 20 micron thick thin film silicon solar cell, they were able to show that in some part of the spectrum that the quantum efficiency, including this nanoparticle layer, was enhanced beyond what the best they could possibly get with the best combination of anti-reflection coating and mirror. So, um, you know, there was a, a definite uh, improvement. Not a large one, but a definite improvement. And uh, just a, a sort of maybe final comment on, on, on this is that uh, some quite recent work has shown that uh, using, uh, yeah, the references there, that whilst silver and gold are the sort of like the classical materials used for, uh, as, as, as nanoparticles to enhance plasmonic response in, in solar cells, um, aluminium is considered, that it, that it, it cons is now considered to be a, a reasonable alternative. Aluminium has a, a resonance in the UV rather than in the visible, but, but it still has the effect of enhancing um, the, the basically um, optical scattering uh, at wavelengths longer than the resonance. And this is a calculation from, from that paper showing how absorption in a thin silicon film can be enhanced using a nanoparticle film on top. So, so these are, I think, again, 
you know, the, the sort of the idea of using nanoparticles to manage the light. They're, they're, they're practical approaches and some progress, some, you know, good, good progress is being made. And I think in the case of, you know, thin filled silicon, it is quite important to think about what, what possibilities these approaches can offer. So, um, in the last bit, I wanted to talk about, uh, a bit about organic photovoltaics. Not about how it works so much, because you've had that, I understand, yesterday. Um, I, I think I'm, go I'm going to sort of, sort of make a selection of the last slides, because I don't think I can get through everything in 10 minutes. Um, but the, let me think about this. Um, in terms of big picture, the final sort of direction um, in terms of trying to improve the cost effectiveness of photovoltaics was to replace our relatively expensive semiconductor material with a cheaper one. You understand the concept. That's the reason why um, thin film materials were developed, why they continue to be developed, and new ways of processing and making um, inorganic thin films are being studied all the time. But it's also the reason that's given forth uh, Disensitized solar cells and organic solar cells. So yesterday you had a lecture from Mario Leclerc about organic solar cells. Um, I have a couple of slides that are just about kind of the basic idea, but the idea is you have uh, semiconductors made from pi conjugated molecular materials. Um, they are attractive because they can be processed directly from solution, and most, but not all, inorganic semiconductors can't. And they're also attractive because you can, you know, choose whatever band gap you like and then make it. You don't kind of rely on nature to find something uh, stable. And because they're solution processable, then in principle they can be printed and coated using technology similar to those that are used for printing and coating of everything else. Um, and so you, you then end up with this concept of kind of a semiconductor layer which is deposited on a flexible substrate and that can then be integrated into devices. And why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because there's a potential for a very much cheaper module cost in comparison with conventional technologies, or at least a cheaper module cost. And it's also interesting because if we're looking at a context where you we're faced with, you know, we, we looked at the very beginning at this projection from the IEA's World, World Energy Outlook where we're told, okay, by, you know, in, in 20 years, 30 years, we need to have a really significant fraction of power generated from PV, or that is the, the expectation. Um, how are we going to get there? And so it means that you need, you, you need technologies that are, that are capable of scaling up production rapidly and where there's no question about the abundance of the materials. And so OPV is kind of interesting from that point, point of view that uh, if this can be done with high efficiency, then rapid growth in, in capacity would be possible. And this, this is just a, a, a sketch of how the, the device looks. Um, uh, typically, your active layer is, is a few hundreds of nanometers thick. And uh, it, its history is, is kind of interesting. When I started to work on solar cells, we were around about here. This is a, a paper published from 2001 by Christoph Brabeck and co-workers. And uh, they discovered that if they did something very, very minor, they thought, they changed the process conditions by changing the solvent for making a, an organic solar cell made from a combination of a, a conjugated polymer and a fullerene, that they could increase the efficiency by about a factor of, of three. Um, and that then, you know, it, it sort of really did two things. One was it said uh, processing is very important. Um, and the other thing is it said that there may be, that maybe there really is potential for generating useful amounts of photocurrent from these materials. And, you know, I mean, I, I, was, I was, you know, I was uh, around then. I just started to, to work on these materials. And, and, you know, there was quite a lot of uh, amusement, I would say, from, from people in the PV community about, about whether these organic semiconductors could ever achieve anything. You know, people laughed about them. They didn't think they were serious. And, and I think that's attitudes changed. I mean, there's certainly still a lot of skepticism about whether they can really deliver. Um, but there's much less 
scepticism about whether they can perform, and I think those are um, different things. So, um, during the last year, we've seen some uh, uh, remarkable increases in efficiency. Um, there's now reports of 10% from another of a number of different sources, but I, I can't show you a, a paper about those. Um, but this is a, a paper that was published last year by um, uh, Yanbing uh, uh, Wu uh, and, and uh, Hongbing Wu and his co colleagues in, 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 uh, in Skut in, in Guangzhou, and that's an 8.4% efficient solar cell. And basically, I show this just because I want to say, look, those current densities are really... Uh, not bad at all, you know, above 15%, probably approaching, I'm sorry, above 15 milliamps and probably approaching 20 milliamps per square centimetre. Okay, so um, uh, efficiency, lifetime, etc., improving over time and various attempts to commercialise the technology. So I, I think I'm going to, um, I think the point I would like to make here, I suppose to motivate the next part which I'm going to summarise, is that there are a number of challenges in the, um, in, the, in the science of organic photovoltaics which are really concerned around finding materials, understanding the materials, making devices, improving their performance, getting the processes that is right. And the same, so a lot of, a lot of attention until now has been directed at increasing efficiency. Um, now, a lot of uh, more, more attention is directed at increasing lifetime and increasing the compatibility with um, sort of manu easy manufacture and easy processes um, with a view to application. But if we think about um, challenges in sort of using these um, PVs in, in the real world, then, then, then there's a number of things that, that ought to be paid attention to. Um, and, and, and here, I mean, if, if, we, uh, if we consider, as, as time goes on, the cost of silicon modules decrease the way they've been decreasing, uh, it leaves a situation where the majority of cost is in, is, is in the balance of systems rather than in the module. Um, and I haven't even, I don't think, I, I don't, this is Ned's pic picture, I don't know if he's even included the cost of bureaucracy, but it's in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but even without the bureaucracy, this is significant. Um, and then there's a question about, if, if we're going to be limited by that, then really does it matter how cheap the blue bit is? And can you make the red bit cheaper by using a flexible solar cell? So another thing is, um, at the end of the day, high lifetimes are achieved for materials that are encapsulated. Encapsulation is costly, um, and, uh, and you've then got a compromise between the cost of the module and its lifetime, which will affect the cost of the electricity. Um, there's a question about uh, if we want to make everything in the system as cheap as possible, then you might compromise on high performance electrode materials and substitute something which has got lower performance but is cheaper and, you know, um, how much would be saved by, by doing that and you can say the same about processes. And then there's a big question really about are there markets for very low power density PV? If we go back to the figure I showed at the beginning where I was looking at the power densities in different places. So I've asked the question, you know, myself, um, you know, could you use OPV in London? And the answer is really not, not really. We can't really use it in London because we have a high sort of density of electricity consumption because there's, not, because there's a, you know, a lot of people there and we don't have very much sun. Um, but there are other places where there's a lot of sun and consumption is lower where there would be a market and, and, um, and, and those questions need, need, to be, need to be established. And then, of course, there's a very important point that, I mean, OPV is not the only thing that can reduce the cost of the module. And when we looked at the roadmaps, for example, for um, SIGs in comparison with, with whatever published ro roadmaps there were for um, OPV, we find that the projection for costs in SIGs and the projections for the costs in OPV cells are really quite similar. Um, and SIGs can be made on a plastic substrate and SIGs can be made on a plastic substrate at an efficiency of nearly 20%. Um, so, you know, there, there are sort of important questions to ask. Now, because I'm virtually at the end of my time, what I'm going to do is tell you what I would have told you if I had more time, which is, 
that we, in order to look at this, we did a, a, a sort of fairly detailed uh, analysis of production of um, PV cells using a, a sort of a real pre-commercial uh, setup that, that belonged to a guy called Frederick Krebs in the Technical University of Denmark. And Frederick was very nice because he allowed my colleague Antonio Urbina um, to go there and, uh, and measure everything, how much is being used, how much electricity, how much materials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Antonio made a, a model of the production of all the different stages and materials involved, processes involved, and then did a life cycle analysis. And the thing, the interesting thing that came out of his life cycle analysis was that um, two thirds of the energy in the module goes into the ITO. Um, and that then raises an interesting possibility that supposing area wasn't a constraint. Supposing you weren't in London, for example, and um, you were somewhere much sunnier. And um, you could then, in terms of, you know, the, the sort of net effect of, you like, displacing fossil fuel power, you could do just as well by replacing ITO with something else as you could by raising the efficiency. Um, we did the LCA of the balance of systems. We compared with uh, other PV technologies. Let me move on to this. just saying ITO again. And there's clearly a, a, a sort of an, an exercise in, in, in what I mentioned already, compromise between the, the lifetime of the module um, and, and, uh, and, um, and the cost of, of encapsulation. If we in, it's assume that encapsulation is not very expensive, things get better and better as you, as you increase the lifetime of your OPV module. It competes earlier, uh, it competes more easily with silicon. But um, the advantage begins to saturate. And the reason the advantage begins to saturate is because you get to the point where the cost of the balance of systems is dominating everything. Um, technical improvement can make it better, etc. So then we did a little bit of work looking at this question of what can you do if you could replace the ITO with something else. So my student, Chris Emmett, had a look at this question. He considered some of the alternatives to ITO that have been published in the literature, silver nanowire, carbon nanotubes, high conductivity PDOT, and then a combination of PDOT with a silver grid. And he did a sort of like a co relative cost and, um, and performance analysis on, on, and, and an energy balance analysis of the different things. And the main thing really to, to come out of this is that um, this is the energy payback time, and this is, you can't see it here, but that's ITO relative to the other. So basically, ITO, um, of course, there's a range in, in estimates just because there's a number of different databases for the, um, the life cycle inventory of, of ITO. But on average, ITO is looking more expensive than the alternatives. And if we, you consider um, both the cost and energy in, in the, into the equation, then the best alternatives are, are high conductivity organics like, like uh, PDOT or silver nanowires. Um, and then when we, we take that into account and then we look at the kind of uh, sort of rel relative cost effectiveness of, of everything, um, the, the cost per unit electricity, it allowed us to look at OPV and then consider some different configurations. So if you say where we are at the moment with basically 2% efficient modules, it's um, you know, as expensive as, as a comparable study for silicon PV or worse, but if we consider various things that could improve, so if we allow for the technology to improve over a period of time, if we replace a low efficiency with a high efficiency module, if we increase the lifetime, if we can get rid of ITO and replace it with something else, all of these things help to improve the cost effectiveness of OPV and bring it to a point where it certainly competes with silicon, um, but it doesn't yet uh, uh, compete very well with other renewables, but we don't know how that was done. But anyway, but you can do within the different PV technologies, you can do this. And it kind of, you know, I suppose in some ways it's a kind of an eye opener because it, it shows you that, that um, improving the efficiency of organic solar cells would be helpful, but it's not going to solve all the problems. There are other things to consider. And really, at the end of the day, all of the thin film. Um, PV technologies, particularly if they're on flex, are going to be addressing uh, uh, similar opportunities and similar markets. And if one is going to sort of prevail over others, there's going to need to be a, a pretty good reason why. Um, 
So I think I'll just jump over that, actually, and come to the end. Um, and um, I, I'll let you read the conclusions at your leisure, and I'll just thank you for your attention. I mean, I think it depends on the context. So, I mean, if, you, if, we, if, we, if we say, you know, if we take, for example, sort of multi-junctions with concentrators as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example of a third-gen system, um, you know, if you're deploying that in a, in a place, you know, so Chile was mentioned earlier as being somewhere where there was, like, really good um, insulation, very clear sky, where I suppose it's good for, for concentrator systems or good for high efficiency conversion. I mean, that's going to be a different context to somewhere which has a more temperate, you know, which has more rain, cloudier skies and so on. So, I mean, I think, I don't know. I mean, we're actually doing some, some sort of analysis of this, this type of, of thing at the moment using data from some different sites in, in India. Where a colleague, my colleague, I keep referring to Ned, that's Ned Eakin's dog. Some of you may have come across, I don't know, come across, but it's somebody who works on high efficiency MPV. And uh, uh, we're, we're, we're sort of trying to ask these kinds of questions by evaluating performance data from a concentrator system and, you know, looking at... I mean, so I, mean, I think the answer is I don't know. Um, but, but I don't think that you could answer... I, th I, th I think the answer is going to be different for every different context, and that's going to depend on, um, you know, what the resource is like and what the demand is like um, and what the size of the facilities you need is like. And it's also going to depend in a lot of cases in practice on what kind of capital is available and what kind of finance is available. Um, Because, uh, yeah, and I think it also depends on, you know, how quickly the, the technology can be made available, you know, how quickly films can be grown and things as well. Um, because if you wanted to supply all the electricity in the world with multi-junctions, then I think that would put a, a strain on production facilities. Uh. I, I, no, I, I do. I certainly do. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I sort of rushed through the last bit because I was aware that I was running out of time. Otherwise, I would have given more justification for why we did what we did. But we did the... Um, in, in doing the cost analysis, so we're not... I mean, because there are no... Op we were modelling an OPV rooftop, rooftop system. I don't know how many OPV rooftop systems there are in the world, but we didn't have access to any, OK? So... I mean, in terms of sort of doing, having a proper model of the balance of systems, we couldn't really say, well, the balance of systems is going to be cheaper because of this or, or that. We did think about, shall we do this on 
you know, some other application like, you know, a portable charger. But we thought most LCA has been done on kind of like, you know, typical like kilowatt, few kilowatt rooftop systems. So let, let's pick that. And then it can only get better. Um, so, so, so the reason that we, we, we chose that as, an, as, an, as, a, as a sort of like a, a reference case was, was so that it would eliminate sort of questions or uncertainties about the cost of the balance of systems from it. So that's what we got when we take conventional cost for the balance of systems. And what we're now doing um, are looking at some other cases where OPV could do things that others can't. I mean, so, and for example there, you might have something like, um, you know, a, a putting a coating on a supermarket roof, a membrane roof, which isn't strong enough to, to support flat plate mm -hmm. silicon, but it would be strong enough to support uh, OPV. And so I think, I think that there are other markets, um, you know, with things like that, with textiles and lightweight materials. Um, but, uh, and you know, I mean, obviously I, I wouldn't really be working on it if I thought there was no future, but, but I think that it's, I, I also think it, it's, it's sort of, it's quite important to, to look at these questions in order not to, to arrive at too simple a conclusion about what the benefit would be of, of raising efficiency. Yeah? Uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, two, the graph that talked about the huge problems with ICO and the cost involved. Are there other alternatives, like uh, what about the zinc oxide, the built zinc oxide? Has anybody got the connectivity uh, you know, good enough to work with OPD? On its own. Um, in the study that we did, we only looked at anodes, and there was a good reason for that. I'm trying to remember what it was. <laughs> at the moment, I can't. I mean, zinc oxide is reasonably effective as a cathode, but you need to. So, actually, in the um, in this, in the, in the, it's because we had zinc oxide on the top actually. That's why we didn't have it on the bottom as well. Yeah, really <laughs> I know there's different dopings. Like indium is one of the dopings, aluminum is one of the dopings. But I wasn't sure which one was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, no. I mean, zinc oxide is pretty good, but you need two electrodes, and they have to be different. PDOT's not very cheap. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's printable, right? It's printable, yeah. And I mean, people do ask the question is, why isn't PDOT cheaper? You know, and I mean, I think it's because somebody's making money out of PDOT at the moment, probably. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, I would think, uh, I think there's a huge potential in the, in the dope conducting organics. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 f the field is so sort of, you know, the, the, the topics are so popular at the moment that almost anything that, you know, that there's a lot of, you know, search for, I mean, I think some of the approaches that are being studied are probably going to go nowhere, nowhere at all. Um, but there's, a, there's sort of quite a wide exploration of different options in, in terms of materials and devices at the moment. Um, you know, if you were to, to, to ask the question, why is nobody looking at high conductivity PDOT, then that would be a, a good question because it's obviously sensible to look at it. But why there's not more on that and less on other things, I can't really answer. But they've used PDOT already, some of them say, like the diagonal, they always use PDOT on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the work that I work work that some work that I know of, where you know alternatives to ITO were studied with some attention in in, in practice. 
found that the high conductivity P dot wasn't just wasn't good enough, and it could be improved by including things like these silver nanowires. Um, and if you're asking why did they go and put in silver nanowires underneath the, as, as well as the P dot rather than modifying the P dot, maybe you know they didn't have the capability to modify the P dot, or maybe it didn't work. I don't I don't really know, but I mean I think I I, I do think that that direction is. You know, make, it makes a lot of sense. Well, I, yeah, I don't know really. <laughs> I think physical texturing is much cheaper to do, but but I I, I just thought I'd include some <coughs> some work on the plasmonics. Uh, you know, it's it's not. I mean, it's it's not it's not really a value judgment. The fact that something was there or, or not not there, but um, I you know I think I think physical texturing is is much more sensible, <laughs> personally. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, I, I, I suppose the, you know, the idea that you could put some, you know, I suppose the idea of being new materials and nano things, there, it's, it's interesting to ask the question how much you could amplify the light field by using that. But in practice, it's going to be much easier to do something like that than it is to, to, to include that extra process stage, I, I think. <laughs>